you are now tuned in to the Worldwide Underground Podcast, episode number six. My name is Gabriel Teodros, and today my guest is the filmmaker, community organizer, Marawi Garima, out of Washington, D.C., currently based in Chicago, Illinois. If you were listening to this podcast a few episodes ago when my guest was Saul Williams, Saul had brought up Marawi's work all on his own, not knowing that I already had this interview scheduled in my calendar. I love the through line that's happening with all the different guests on this podcast. And speaking of through lines, in this episode, we talk about Marawi's debut film, Residue. Came out in 2020 to critical acclaim, and it was distributed by Ava DuVernay's independent distribution company, Array. Ava was very inspired by Marawi's parents, Haile Garima and Sharikiana Garima, who in their day, put out and distributed their own films when Hollywood wouldn't green light the films that they were making because they were centering black stories from black perspectives. And it's a beautiful thing to see the work that Haile and Shurikiana helped inspire basically give way to the distribution network that their son then released his first film through. I did want to contextualize a few things for you in this episode. I talk about Haile Garima's impact and influence on me a lot. You'll hear some more of that in this episode. And you'll hear how I first met Haile Garima. But it's a lot bigger than just one person. Um, I met Marawi my first time at Sankofa, which is a bookstore, video store, more of a community center. I've heard highly refer to it as a liberated space for black people in Washington, D.C., right across the street from Howard University. And uh, I first started going to Sankofa back in 2008. We talk about that time. I was distributing an album, just released an album with a crew called the Kaffa Beans. That was an Ethiopian-American hip-hop collective consisting of Burnt Face, Wayna, who went on to get nominated for a Grammy for her cover of Minnie Ripperton's Loving You. Uh, who else was in that group? B. Sheba, AP, and myself. And um, yeah, I started going to Sankofa back in 2008. Washington, D.C. became a second home for me. And uh, Sankofa was the center of my whole D.C. universe. I spent so much time in D.C. from the years 2008 to, I guess, 2014 that it led to the whole Children of the Dragon record that I did out there, which was primarily recorded with people that I met through Sankofa or people that I met through people I met at Sankofa. And uh, yeah, it's just a big part of my life as an artist, big part of my DNA, I should say. And Marawi Garima is one of those artists that I met in those times. You know, I named this podcast Worldwide Underground for a lot of reasons. If you know my work, I hope you figured out by now that I never name anything for just one reason. There's usually multiple meanings behind every title. So Worldwide Underground came about through a conversation that I was having with some of my former colleagues at KEXP who basically sat me down and said, I need to I need to run my own podcast. So I took their advice and you're listening to the results. Worldwide Underground is an obvious nod to an album by Erica Badu. A less obvious nod to Mystic Journeyman's record, the same name, that came out years before that. And I just love the concept of being underground and worldwide at the same time. Underground 
It's a state of being. It's a feeling. It's something I strongly identify with as an independent hip hop artist that really had to learn how to distribute music myself. But it's also a lot older and a lot bigger than hip hop. I can show you a Curtis Mayfield song recorded in the 1970s all about the underground and he's talking about music back then too. But also Worldwide Underground resonates with me because I'm an artist who most people probably never heard of. But I've gotten to travel through music through a lot of this world. And I got to spend time learning from a lot of other independent practitioners of many different crafts, not just music, in a lot of different scenes. I wanted a space for all of these different kinds of stories to breathe. This podcast is an experiment in bringing all of my different worlds together, worldwide underground. One week, you might hear from an independent MC from South Seattle. The next week, a filmmaker from Washington, D.C. You might hear an author after that and an organizer. And the next week might be a chef. But you'll see how we're all connected and how all the work that we do, these different fronts, all matters. It's all about bringing community together, lifting up our stories, being our own media, realizing that we have the power to create the world that we want to see right here within our grasps. And it's a war of stories, of course. We all are storytellers at the end of the day through all these different mediums. I think that's the one thing that unites us all. Also, in this time in history, I'm really drawn to the artists who blur the lines. And Marawi Garima is absolutely one of those artists. In fact, in this interview, he says he's trying to shatter the wall between filmmaker and organizer. And I'm so proud of him for the way he stepped up and been such a vocal advocate in solidarity with the people of Palestine these last few months. We talk a lot about that solidarity work, why it's important, what it means, and so much more. Thank y'all for tuning in once again. And thank you to everyone who supports. This is a completely independent experiment in long form storytelling. If you wanna sign on, sign up, be the first to hear the next episode and support all the work that we're doing here on the Worldwide Underground. Head to gabrielteodros.substack.com and subscribe. That's all you got to do. There's no advertising. There's nothing else. It's just listeners and storytellers. That's what makes this thing run. So with no further ado, here's Marawi Garima on the Worldwide Underground. Peace. Hey, it's the Worldwide Underground. I am joined today by the one and only Marawi Garima, live from D.C. today. How are you doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you for making some time. I was, um, before we uh, jump into it, I was trying to remember the first time I met you. And um, I was wondering what you remember about it, because I I seem to have this memory of you and Tensai inside of Sankofa maybe after hours. Hmm. I, I don't know if he was playing the bass or you were learning an instrument. I think I might've been rapping. Hmm. Um, does any of this ring a bell for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, I mean, I, I wasn't thinking about this one specifically around, I remember, I think my first memory of you was outside of San Copa when you were rapping. You okay. came with your group or it was a group of rappers. Okay. Um, and I think y'all had the burnt face. Um, Burn face was probably there for sure. Yeah, Wayna yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think y'all came down together and you were kind of doing your thing. They was there doing their thing. 
Um, but I do remember a jam session. I mean, me and Tensai, he 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 plays the bass really well, and I was right. trying to learn the bass along with right. his lead guitar. And he, um, yeah, he we had a couple of cool sessions together. And I, I do kind of remember the one where you were you were doing your thing. Yeah, it was, it was cool. like after hours. Yeah, I think it was the first time I I, I connected with you in a room. You know, that mm-hmm. I do remember what you're talking about with Wayna and Elias. Um, that would have been my first time really around Sankofa ever. Mm-hmm. That would have been probably 2008. Yep. So e- everyone cool. everyone was brand new to me at that point, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, S- Sankofa is such a special place, man. I want I wanted to ask you, like, going, c- coming off that memory, was music something that you ever um, did more with? Was that was that was that a passion of yours, or is it something that you still mess with? <clears throat> that's a good question, man. You know, at the time, it was what I wanted to do. You know, I had okay. I was an undergrad, and um, yeah, I wanted I, I had dreams of being, you know, Jimi Hendrix. You know what I mean? That whole kind of thing. I really got into um, into rock music real hard, randomly. Mm. You know, mm. um, listen to Jimmy f- for the first time, uh, and then I got through him introduced to um, you know Funkadelic. Eddie Hazel, who's one of the greatest, you know, guitarists Absolutely. to do it. You know what I mean? And uh, in fact, Maggot Brain became basically the anthem of my life, you know, kind of carried mm. me through that time period, especially. And um, and even when I stopped playing music, Maggot Brain kind of maintained that, that importance for me. I, in fact, I had a cut of residue with Maggot Brain in it, you know, because it was a dream of mine. Yeah, ten years later to um, yeah to have that in the film, but um, that and then summertime, you know, Janis Joplin's rendition of Summertime was a big one for me. You know, I I, I was so late to Janis Joplin. I just heard that like maybe in the last two years. It's yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and and they were touring that joint, so they had so many different versions. There's mm-hmm. one specific one, which was the one for me, and um, I'll find the, the the location she was at if you if you you know if you want it, I send it to you later. But that joint, I had a cut of residue with that one and with that song in it too. There's a you know a scene where he gets robbed. It's a little you know he gets he gets knocked out by this dude that's robbing him. Right. And he goes uh, through this whole kind of like dream sequence kind of moment, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that was originally cut to summertime by Janis Joplin. Yeah. Um, and that was also, you know, a dream I always had was to have that in a, in a, um, in a film, but I couldn't get the rights to it. Couldn't, you know, first time filmmaker, I ain't know, I ain't had no lawyers, you know what I mean? I ain't had no way yeah. to like track those kinds of things down. So we ended up, you know, changing it and going somewhere else, but there's a whole narrative that was encased mm-hmm. in the lyrics of summertime that, that mm-hmm. section of the film is edited to, that is, you know, you know, it still kind of remains and if you kind of watch it on yeah. its own and kind of see the trajectory of the dream sequence. But yeah. without the assistance of that song and the way it's delivered by that band, uh, it's just, yeah. it's a whole different vibe. You know what I mean? And, um, that makes yeah, a lot it, of it, sense. It was a major blow. It was a major blow. Yeah. yeah. You got a, did you get a Beyonce clearance for the opening of the film? No, that's, um, that's CCB. That's okay. CCB. Oh, yeah, I had a mo- I had a moment where it sounded like Beyonce. I was like, "How do they do oh, yeah. this?" No, no, no. That's uh, that's CCB. That's Roll Call. That's one of the anthems. One of the okay. bands in the city, um, Critical Condition band. They they signed on. They you know we got the rights from them. Um, Dope. So that was that was, you know, what we lost in some of the early kind of versions of the film. We made up for and just kind of like these bands from the city, you know, which brought so much more DC authenticity to it. Yeah, you know, kind of signing off and giving us their music to be able to, you know, and then yeah. and then I think it in turn helped with the resurgence of that song, you know, because the song was was kind mm-hmm. of going around the city a whole lot more after the film came out, you know. Mm-hmm. That go go scene is like, I mean, part of my ignorance is it's it's such a thing that's like in DC. If you're not in it, if you're not around it, you might not know about stuff that's like legendary to DC, you know. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, both of your parents are highly influential uh, filmmakers in their own regard. Yeah. And 
you know, I got a lot artist world, right? Like we we have kids and we saw, we see our children like go in different directions a lot of times, and it's kind of rare. Yeah, I feel like that the child like follows exactly the path set out by their parents. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you, like having two filmmaker parents and then going into filmmaking yourself later in life? You know, at first I was against it. You know, at first I wanted mm-hmm. to be, you know, I was in the video games as a kid. I was a little bit of a nerd, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, I wanted to be like a, a video game, some, some, some related to it in some way, you know, a developer or programmer. I didn't know what the words were or to be the type of person who kind of works on. Remember back in the day before the graphics were that great in the game, they would have like those cinematics, you know, where the graphics were, were nice, you know, like the CG graphics kind of up front for the cut scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to be somebody who designed that, you know, like a 3D kind of designer. Um, yeah. I got to fan you, which is where I went for undergrad. And um, they didn't really have, well, they had a 3D, 3D art class, but they didn't really have that program. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, I was so confused. I, I changed my major about three or four, maybe even five times while I was an undergrad um, okay. at FAM. And then I transferred from FAM U. I went to Howard. Uh-huh. Um, and I graduated with a degree in graphic design. And, okay. Um, and the whole time it was in the back of my head that, um, you know, I was looking for some way, you know, some kind of, you know, art that was, that felt satisfying and that felt fulfilling. Um, mm-hmm. and honestly, I, 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 I never really felt fulfilled. You know what I mean? I, I went from. Mm-hmm general studies to biology. I was thinking about being a doctor at one point to make money. And then I made the transition to jazz studies, which is when I picked up the guitar, played the guitar for mm-hmm. a while, then switched over when I transferred, well, I switched over to, to 3D art when I was transferred to Howard. And then from 3D art to um, to graphic design. And in graphic design, you learn photography, you learn drawing, mm-hmm. painting, you know, um, 3D composition and shit like that. And mm-hmm. And those were fun classes, but nothing really grabbed me as, as like, this is where I, I feel like I'm. And it was basically just this whole thing where I I, I think I had taken on and learned um, a certain type of audiovisual language, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just through osmosis, being around my parents and their mm-hmm. work. And it mm-hmm. wasn't until I made my first short film that that language, that you know, ability to speak that language was first given expression and yeah you know from the first short film i was like yeah this feels like something where i'm using or have the ability to begin to use you know all my kind of faculties in a way that's fulfilling mm-hmm. to me you know mm-hmm. um and none of it was a waste though because even once i started pursuing film you know I was, my, my early short films are you know i'm proud of them all but it wasn't until i started bringing in kind of all of my previous you know um lessons from art you know from drawing painting Mm -hmm. you know photography bringing all those things you know what i mean into some into one composite one kind of comprehensive approach that i really took off you know as a filmmaker and so they all came to fruition and music is the one that's still lagging behind where i feel I, i feel pretty good about you know knowing you know what music is appropriate but Mm -hmm. not necessarily um, having the compositional skills that I have in these other art forms, you mm. know, I still, um, uh, that's still an area that I want to explore, you know, which is an exciting part about it, you know what I mean? To, to mm-hmm. know, you know, kind of your shortcomings that you want to shore up at some point, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense to me too, because, um, you know, someone who has primarily done music my whole life, I find that whenever I, you know, experiment with other art forms, which I've been doing for a lot of the last 10 years, um, everything that I've learned through hip hop is something that can be applied to, you know, if I'm writing short fiction or if I'm doing a radio show or, you know, like, yeah, it makes sense to me that all the different things that you studied, you were able to kind of coalesce. And like, once you got to film, it just all made sense. Like, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and also like this whole thing about music, Mm-hmm. you know, seeing it as something that I don't have that skill set in to be able to compose music. It's not that mm-hmm. I have to be able to compose my own music. Right. Although in a pinch, if I need to, that's great. But in order to be able mm-hmm. to collaborate better with a composer, 
it helps speak to know, the language. you know, yeah. to, to, exactly to be able to speak that language. And yeah. um, that's what I really mean is, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, honestly, if anybody's asking me questions about this stuff, this is kind of, this is, this is my position, you know what I mean? That like, you should know every aspect of it. You know, film requires a comprehensive approach, just like painting does. You know, you don't dole mm-hmm. out, the, you know, you don't um, not understand all the aspects of painting. You know what I'm saying? You have to understand them all in order to, you know, successfully mm-hmm. to bring your vision to life. You know what I mean? And so yeah. the same goes for, uh, for filmmaking, you know what I mean? That, that makes a lot of sense, you know, and it mirrors exactly what I tell younger rappers who are, you know, trying to break in with their own music. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a producer, but you should absolutely learn everything that goes into those roles so you can speak the language and, you know, yeah, so have and better also, results and collaborate more effectively, you know? Right. Absolutely. And yeah. also so that you can do those things if you have to you know a lot of this comes from just watching my parents you know kind of you know they're both for those who don't know my parents are filmmakers you know what i'm saying they are independent filmmakers in like the truest sense of the word you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and oftentimes the most limiting factor is is the fact that they don't have money to be able to do this or do that and um, just kind of watching them navigate that type of world really instilled in me a desire to be able to bring any project to completion no matter mm-hmm. what you know what i'm saying if everybody jumps ship i can at least know enough about every role that i can complete the project and yeah. better yet to make myself into the type of person who with my friends films and even with my family's like now i'm doing the sound design on my father's this 10-hour documentary he's doing to be able Amazing. to slot in to any project in any role, yeah. you know what I'm saying? To be able yeah. to, to be that type of player that you can bring into any position, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And be able to play that position effectively. Um, that's the type of that, person I want to be, you know? That's amazing. I noticed in your story, you didn't mention film school. Was that was that not something you did? In the story, in Residue? No, in your story that you just told us about, uh, about, did you, did yeah. you, could, Go ahead. In resi- in residue, the character came 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 back to DC from film school. But in real life, like you, Marawi, like did you get into film making just kind of like from watching your parents and then experimenting? Like, did you just jump into it that way, or was there was there some type of film school involved as well? Yeah, so I, I did go to film school. Okay, uh, for for grad school, and it's funny because okay. I just I just posted a you know just an angry story uh-huh. today about it just because you know i owe two hundred thousand dollars plus from that experience wow. you know three wow years, th- in three years you know you rack up enough you know you rack up that much kind of debt going to you know one of these film schools mm-hmm. um and so that's why i tend to not even talk about it because i don't even want to give them shine accidentally you know what i mean makes sense um, at the end of the day like <clears throat> you know these are essentially skills that you can learn anywhere you know what i mean if you yeah. kind of you know have the yeah. drive and desire and discipline self-discipline to kind of pick them up and so yeah. you know three years you know after, after having experienced three years of that you know what i mean that's it's it's, it's more clear to me than ever before that film school is a it's a bit of a scam if you got to pay for it you know what mm. I mean? mm-hmm. if you have a you know full ride and shit like that then uh yeah absolutely go um, but, um, if not, you know, I would either suggest people go to affordable film schools. I was talking about this film school in Cuba called EICTV, which is mm. one of the illest film schools out there. Dope. And, um, yeah, I learned Spanish, but, you know, you go down mm-hmm. there and, and you, you spend three years and you come out, you know, like with the, with the type of, of filmmaking skills that in fact you wouldn't be able to get at a school like, you know, any one of these Hollywood feeders, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right you get a more um um you get an approach to to dramatic to drama and um and filmmaking that has everything to do with actually bringing change into the world rather than only yeah. existing as a uh, kind of of a producer of a commodity you know what i'm saying to be exploited by some white dude in hollywood Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. This is the first time I heard about a film school in Cuba, but that makes so much sense. Oh man. The yeah, Cuba I got man. to I got to go to Cuba. You been there before? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I got to go to Cuba too, like a couple of years ago. And um 
it's just something I, I wish I wish every black person in America specifically Facts. Facts. could go to Cuba, spend some time, see what it's like. You know, I got off Facts. the plane. I was it felt like an African country, like yeah. off off the rip, thousand you know, percent. thousand percent. And, yeah. And then it's like to be in a place where like they don't have advertising the way Bruh. we do. It's just, it, the like most, the, it the, the effect so that simple. does. The the effect that does to you where there's like billboards, but the billboards are all about ideas, like revolutionary yeah. ideas and not selling you nothing. Like, yeah. yeah, to, to, I could just imagine what a film school is like coming out of that environment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's ill. Yeah. That's ill. Cuba, man. Cuba, um, it's a no fly zone for, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the bullshit ideas that we just swim in, not knowing that it's right. the water that we swim in. You know what I mean? Right. And like you said, you never experienced no advertisements, and you, yeah. it seems so simple, but it's actually <laughs> it has, a, it's a, it has a visceral effect. You know what I mean? When you go, and then when you come back, it has another visceral effect coming back mm -hmm. into a sea of advertisement. I remember it's just so trying different. not to look. I was driving down the highway. I was like, I'm just going to try and keep it going and just not look at these billboards. But of course, yeah. it's impossible. It's, it is the oxygen you breathe when you come to the United States, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Man, um, I got like a million questions for you. Um, <laughs> the, the, I just want to give you props for the film. Like I watched it for the first time yesterday. I was very late to it. I was very excited that it existed when it came out, you know, right. just knowing you and knowing your history and your family's history and right. seeing you like get into filmmaking, like it was amazing. But once I finally like sat down and watched the film, like, yeah, man, like you, you touch on so many emotions in that film. Like it's very, like, it's a very visceral film. I feel like, you know, just that, that feeling of coming back to your home and not recognizing it and missing people and um, the gentrification that DC has gone through mirrors a lot of the gentrification that Seattle has gone through, you know, um, yeah. it just, yeah, there were so many emotions that I felt throughout my life that you had in there. And it's, yeah, it was, it was really beautifully done. Um, I appreciate that. How, how long did you work on that, on that joint? Like from, from, the beginning of you like writing the script. Yeah. Um, it took four years to make. We started in. Um, okay. Started writing in 2016, summer of 2016. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, you know, I was I was still in school. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I wanted to I wanted to finish the film before I graduated. Mm -hmm. um, just a uh, challenge to myself, you know what I'm saying? And also, you know, the crisis that was, you know, that is still going on in DC was very motivating for me. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, 2016, I started writing it with the goal of shooting it the following summer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so yeah, we wrote it in a year while I was taking classes. You know, it was first mm -hmm. draft of a script. You know what I mean? I didn't really have time to revise. You know what I mean? It was yeah, all those things. You know what I mean? And 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 I say that because generally, you know, you, you like to have a script in like a yeah. really advanced stage before you go into the process of bringing money in to shoot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, and I couldn't do that. You know, not only did I not have any money, I didn't have time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so basically um, we ended up at the point of getting ready to shoot and we had this script that was still kind of in so much, it was in flux, you know, so much of it was changing. Mm -hmm. um, but we ended up shooting anyway with this incomplete script or this, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like this first draft. And it turned out to kind of be a blessing and kind of be a curse because there was so much that we could kind of figure out as we went, you know what I mean? We were kind of beholden to it. And it's, you can kind of see it in the film. The film is very um, modular, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of got these sequences that, you know, are, you know, kind of tenuously connected to each other that arrive mm -hmm. on time by the end to make sense of the whole, you know what I mean? His, his final yeah. kind of transformation. So, uh, yeah, it worked out in the end. You answered, you answered like one of my questions in, the, in that, which is, um, I was wondering how much improv played a role in, in your process because it seemed like some of those scenes, it just didn't seem like it was acting. It just seemed like, you know, like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I like mean, it, you know, 
Right. Like it seemed, it, it seemed real, is what I'm saying. Like it seemed like you were, you were just capturing real moments, and 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 it worked in this film for this story, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, and the other thing I was wondering about was, um, I even wrote down, wrote this down because it really stood out to me. Just the first voice in the film, who's asking you, did you actually think a script could make a difference? You thought a film could save us. Was that always in the script, or was it like? Was that thought kind of something you came to in the process of making the film later? I actually didn't write that till you know near the end of editing. Wow! Um, you know, one of the the harder things to figure out for the film was the opening. You know what I mean? Okay. How to start the film, and um, but the 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 through line of that, you know, the idea behind it had always been there. You know, that kind mm-hmm. of self doubt. Um, and also, you know, the self-criticism of going away, you know what I mean, surviving, whatever you want to call it. Then not only that, but also, you know, kind of like going to film school, you know, going to school in general, you know what I mm-hmm. mean? All that privilege that that entails. Um, right. And then kind of coming back, you know. And not only that, going to film school with like all these white saviors, you know, all these students mm-hmm. who have like who are just so kind of tied up with this white savior complex. Mm-hmm. And, and and then see also black people do the same thing, you know, kind of black people who are willing to sell their communities to make a buck. You know what I mean? Yeah. And. Uh, you know, it, it was an unanswered question that that definitely that bedeviled me throughout the process. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that and that caused me hesitation at at many points, you know what I mean. Um, mm-hmm. But it was I, I feel ultimately, you know what I mean, important for me to go through in order to end up where I'm at now, which is you know I, I wasn't organizing back then, you know uh-huh. I was kind of on my path just to be an artist, just to be a filmmaker, just to devote myself like a monk, you know, what I'm saying to filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was ultimately that kind of um, dissatisfaction with, you know, just the, you know, the fact that the effect of a film is not easily measurable. Mm-hmm. You know, it's such a long game. You hope that it yeah. has some some effect in the world, but you yeah. can't really measure it. There's some films that cause immediate kinds of consequences, but generally most yeah. people just they say that they want to change the world. You know what I mean? That's why I'm a filmmaker and I'm gonna make these films that are going to do so many things for so many people. And it's just not sure. It's just not, you can't, you know, so much of it is, um, is just idealism, you know? Yeah. And, um, meanwhile, my sister is a teacher, you know what I mean? And she's very much on the front lines having real measurable effect in people's lives. You know what I'm saying? Despite, Mm -hmm. you know, the struggle, um, to do Mm -hmm. so. Mm-hmm. And so it set me on a quest to kind of try to bridge that gap, um, you know, and then also, of course, the film coming out to a lot of, you know, critical acclaim, whatever. But the people mm-hmm. on Q Street, you know, what I'm saying still subject to gentrification, still subject to police brutality, still subject to, you know, all the things that were there before. Right. Um, So organizing, you know, I think once I got sucked into that whirlwind, you know what I mean? It it really, um, a lot of, a lot of things clicked into place in terms of how to become the filmmaker that I want to be, you know, but, um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect, that's a perfect segue to, to, to my next question, which is also kind of the, the key reason I wanted to add this conversation with you now is, um is your organizing work. You have been so consistent these last several months uh, speaking up for Palestine. And, you know, I follow you online and I just seeing all the different like actions that you've been a part of. Um, Yeah. I I would, I would love to hear a little bit about your journey, like how you got into community organizing and, you know, how art plays a role and, and just what that, what that's like for you now, you know? Yeah. Um, so I first got started in 2020, you know, I was, okay. I was late to the, to the organizing mm-hmm. kind of situation, you know, artists tend to be late, you know, because <laughs> we tend to be so individualistic, you know, I think we're encouraged mm-hmm. to, you know, just kind of recede into our, 
you know, our caves, our towers, you know what I'm saying? And just kind of shoot out a project every once in a while that we hope will land on a target. Mm. Um, and I was no different, you know what I mean? Um, in fact, I think I looked down on organizers, just like, you know, mm. typical liberal kind of ideas of like, uh, you know, it's never like, you know, not only um, the, uh, I always fuck up this word. What's the word? Oh, cynicism. Not only the cynicism, mm-hmm. but also just kind of. Ah. Like, you know. All right. We had a, we had a technical difficulty, but we back now. So the last thing you were saying was um, as a, yeah. when, when you were just doing artwork, you were looking at organizing with uh, with cynicism was the last word you said. And we lost yeah, I used, you. I used to look down on organizers, you know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> that they wouldn't get anything done. It's not, you know, nothing's changing, you know. Um, and I was just like, every, you know, all these other artists, very individualistic, you know what I'm saying, thinking that my film would do something, you know, whatever. So uh, in 2020, George Floyd Rebellion, you know, um, I moved to Chicago, which is where my fiance lives, just where she's from. So I went out there when they started shutting down the cities and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, a couple months later, the whole, you know, George Floyd band kicked off. And, yeah. And I, I had been um, a little bit more interested in kind of just, you know, politics all of a sudden, you know, the whole Bernie shit, you know, was interesting to me. Um, mm. And uh, I think generally just socialism was just starting to be more and more interesting. I was just like, okay, what's this about? You know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can't read two pages into any kind of socialist text without, you know, you the um, coming across the idea that you can't just read this shit. You got to put it into practice, you know? Right. And um, so very quickly, I was just looking for a way to get involved, you know, um, and there was an organization in Chicago which actually put out a, a, a nationwide a call for a nationwide action. Um, and there was the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, and mm-hmm. that weekend was the biggest weekend. You know, where hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people just hit the streets you mm-hmm. know, across the United States. Mm-hmm. And uh, and from then on, I just started kind of tracking with them. You know what I mean? Saying you know, the Chicago chapter of it, the Chicago Alliance, you know, um, and just kind of pulling up to a whole bunch of their events and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of how I got my start was with the Chicago Alliance, just kind of seeing how, you know, um, active they were, how energized they were, and just kind of how sharp they were in terms of like where to be and when, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, three years later, I'm still rocking with the Chicago Alliance. They're incredible. Except mm-hmm. now in 2023, you know, we have fallen back <clears throat> and um, really, you know, are now pushing to, you know, we, we, we fa- have fallen back in order to support the Palestinian leadership, you know. Right. And um, that's nationwide, but certainly in Chicago as well, because Chicago, you know, Chicago, the Midwest in general, Chicago, Detroit, you know, Minnesota is a massive Palestinian population. Yeah, absolutely, I think the biggest in the country, and so I think that um, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, it just it just there's so much happening, you know, in Chicago. Um, you know, one of the, the the main kind of organizations out here, USPCN, mm-hmm. um, US Palestinian Network, is mm-hmm. you know, again, it's just like it's easy to kind of take leadership from organizations like them who are just so sharp and consistent, you know. And yeah. um, they're, they, from the first action in Chicago, you know, in 2020, around the George Floyd Rebellion, you know, in the midst of the Black Liberation Movement's kind of ascendant, mm-hmm. you know, ascendant position, mm-hmm. um, they were everywhere we went, you know what I mean? Shoulder to shoulder with us, um, mm. you know, Palestinians, Filipino organizations as well, yeah. Chicano organizations. And so it's, it's very, mm-hmm. you know, it's a very fluid transition now to... Um, to leadership in this in this moment where it's their feet to the fire, you know. Absolutely, um, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. This is this is maybe a very basic question, but but one that I think um, more and more people need to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think it's important for Black people and Ethiopian people, because you stand in both, to be in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle? You know, yeah, it's um. At the end of the day, you know, the enemy that we fight is the same, you know, 
at the end of the day, you know, um, the source of our misery, you know what I mean, around the planet is United States imperialism, mm -hmm. you know, and um, this question of Palestine is at the heart of that, you know, of that, of that, um, of that whole issue. It is such a pillar of United States ability to dominate the entire planet, um, which is why you're seeing Biden is willing to lose the presidency. You know, the Democrats are willing to lose the presidency rather than to give up on Israel, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Israel, I mean, Palestine has to be free. You know, it, it has to. And it will. And in so doing, it will kick out one of the legs of the stools, you know, of United States imperialism. Mm. And as the stool, you know, teeters, all of our work is improved by that. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, that's why you always see me pushing just black liberation is Palestinian liberation because, yeah. you know, like the sister in my video I just posted the other day said it best, if they're not free, who's free? You know, you can't that's call right. yourself free if anybody on, around the planet is, you know, living in abject, you know, in, in apartheid, in abject poverty, in, you know, um, under genocide, you know, being genocided, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. um, yeah and and you know I think um, also you could just see how how much of a gift the Palestinian resistance has been to struggles around the planet it is you know you know first 2020 and then now in 2023 this is you know such an incredibly illuminating moment Absolutely. You know, Palestine, the Palestinian resistance is bringing clarity like never before. Absolutely. Like never before. You know what I mean? You In get terms to see of, exactly who people are, where they stand, who's going to show up, who's going to fight for you, who's not, who's going to be silent. Like, it's just, this is one of those generation defining moments, man. I keep saying it like what what we all do in this season of our lives is something that we will carry with us for the rest of our days. And our kids are going to ask us about it. You know, like it's bookmark what you just said, because I want to respond to that. But I also want to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it's showing people where everybody stands. Right. And there's this there's a phrase that the, uh, the movement in Chicago uses or, you know, I guess beyond. But certainly Chicago is, you know, a, a progressive except on Palestine. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's the best way to just sift, what's it, the wheat from the chaff, you know, mm -hmm. whatever from the thing. Mm -hmm. Because in 2020, anybody could say Black Lives Matter. You right. know what I'm saying? Any right. corporation, any racist politician, mm -hmm. any liberal politician who, you know, in, in, uh, in, 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 ver you know, in, um, in rhetoric will, uh, you know, you know, say whatever they can to appease black folks, but indeed will do everything they can to destroy any semblance yeah. of democratic rights for black people. The gentrified you know I mean? with the Black Lives Matter signs in their yards always get yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know that mm -hmm. twenty twenty illuminated is you know kind of the, the rhetorical weakness of that as a slogan, mm -hmm. but now we're seeing the strength, you know what I mean, um, of a slogan that cannot be co opted. Right. No corporation can say free Palestine. Right. No politician <laughs> can say free Palestine. You know what mm -hmm. I mean, and not mean it. You know what I mean? Right. Because they'll be risking everything to do it. That's you know right. What I mean? That's right. And um, and it it show even Bernie. You know, the ultimate progressive. Can't even say Bernie it. failed that. You know yep. what I mean? It exposed his genocidal. You know, it's this whole kind of this thing of like these social democrats. You know, uh, the the squad, et cetera. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It kind of exposes mm -hmm. their. You know. Um, their contradiction between their domestic policy and their foreign policy, because in foreign policy, they fall right in line. You right. know what I mean? Uh, right. Bernie Sanders is willing to genocide Palestinians. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so it just kind of shows that like uh, no fake progressive can, can, um, can, can survive this litmus test. Yeah. You know now I mean? Rashida is the only one to me. She's yeah. the realist. Yeah. That's it. The whole squad went down shamefully. Shamefully. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, um, it's not Rashida's 
uh, social democrat that social democratness that's pushing her onto the right side of this. It's yeah. her national identity. It's the fact that she's Palestinian that's pushing her onto the right side of this. That's you know right. what I mean? And um, but everybody yeah. else who she thought she was in the same boat as she's seeing that they're not. You know? I know. It's very but, very illuminating. You yeah. said you said you wanted to respond to the to the generation defining moment thing. What was it that you were saying? Um, yeah, it was that. It was that this is this is a moment that we'll remember for our entire lives. Oh. And, our ki- and our kids are going to ask us about this, you know? Yeah, I mean, that too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, what I wanted to say was there's this way that some people, you know, are kind of formulating this as like, you know, one moment that will pass. And then there's going to be another uh, moment that happens after that, you know, like. People who talk mm-hmm. about World War Three. People who talk about conflict with China and all this other kind of shit. But like, you know, all those things may come. But oh, no, what's guaranteed yeah. is that like, what happens is going to flow directly forth from this moment. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's going to be how we position ourselves, how hard we fight in this moment to gain mm-hmm. an advantageous position over imperialism. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Which is going to determine the degree to which we're able to respond to whatever comes next. You know yeah. what I mean? So this is not a thing that anybody can sit out. Right. It's the single most important revolution of the 21st century. And I'm just pulling that from, you know, my organization, Frank Chapman, you know, mm. um, our national executive director. He's just, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I'm quoting him directly because it's yeah. such an important kind of thing to keep in mind, which is that, like, it's not just any other kind of conflict. Mm-hmm. It is... You know, it's it's one of it is a spoke that is turning the wheel on everybody's fight. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. For a better existence, you know, for a better world. It is that spoke right now. You know what I mean? That everybody has to grab a hold of and to turn. There's many spokes on the wheel, but right yeah. now that one is doing most of the work. Um, but it's also just interesting because again, I'm in Chicago. My work is in the Black Liberation. My primary work is in the Black Liberation Movement. You mm-hmm. know, the Chicago Alliance. Our two campaigns are you know, community control of the police and then um, fighting to get people out who have been wrongfully convicted, you know, Dope. tortured by police. Chicago is the wrongful conviction capital of the states mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. of the world probably, you know, by virtue, but, um, and police torture as well. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. um, so there's a constant balancing act that also has to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I have a co-chair and um, I'm, I'm one of the leaders of the, uh, our committee to, you know, our campaign to get people out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of that committee. Mm-hmm. And um, I work with a sister named Jasmine Smith, who's really one of the most incredible organizers I've, you know, come across, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And she's constantly reminding me that, you know, yeah, there's a war going on there. And we're also at war here, you know, still right. in the United States, you know, and that we have to fight as hard as we possibly can to, um, to, um, to do both. You know, to balance yeah. our work, you know, and so, yeah. um, and 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 it's 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 um, it is, um, that's when we're at our best, you know. What I'm saying is like when we're, you know, kind of um, making sure that our work is getting done and using our spare, you know, not only our spare work but also great, you know, degrees of our energy towards the work of our our other comrades who need us most. You know, what I'm saying and so. Um, mm-hmm. It's a beautiful moment, man. It's a beautiful struggle. It's, 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 of course, the most horrific moment you can imagine. And at the same time, just our resistance, our, you know, our ability to, uh, to respond to it, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, um, it's incredible. And, and I think that um, um, nobody's coming through this moment unscathed. You know what I'm saying? No, no. You know, no I, said that the, I said that the other day on my socials. I was like, I don't, I don't think any of us are the same after this, you know? No. Nah. Nah, you can't even if you were nah, yeah. Nah. yeah this is a personal question and if you don't have an answer to it it's okay but i feel compelled to ask yeah with all the work that you were doing on multiple fronts you know um and even in the face of a genocide like like we just said it is it is soul draining what are ways that you recharge and and stay grounded through it all like how does this not just completely like you know drain the life out of you how, how are you staying motivated through this 
by by taking action. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. By by remaining involved. You yeah. know, it's 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 it, the work itself regenerates you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. um, the struggle itself rejuvenates you. You know, it mm-hmm. recharges your battery. It was when I wasn't active. You know, yeah. what I mean? it was in the early days when we was kind of just watching this shit happen mm-hmm. that I was at my lowest. You know. But the moment the opportunity presented itself and I and I grabbed a hold of it along with everybody else to start yeah. fighting back. Yeah. Man, I've been on, you know what I mean? I've been up, you know, and yeah. and um and energized since then. Of course it's a roller coaster, you know, but mm-hmm. it's very clear mm-hmm. that like it's only when you feel helpless as an individual that you mm-hmm. um your your battery starts to drain un- unceasingly, you know what I'm saying? But the moment right. that you kind of take up collective work and activity. You know what I mean? It's uh, the opposite begins to happen because you suddenly feel your power and your ability to do something about it. Mm-hmm. You know, the powerlessness is um, is what drains you. You know, that so makes a lot. Of, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. There's a writer I love who says something similar. Daniel Jose Older. He, he writes uh, sci-fi, fantasy, sci, you know, science fiction. And uh, he said these days, for him, the protests are the only place where it feels sane to be, <laughs> you know? Facts. Facts. Yeah, this is the Facts. only place. That's yeah. percent That's and, real. Um, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask uh, just another question. How, you know, with your work as a filmmaker and an organizer, I, I think I saw you write on your social media, you're a community organizer first, filmmaker second. Yeah. H- how do these two, you know, how do these two paths of work like how do, how does it work together does it work together how does it form each other you know yeah well i mean this goes back to what we was talking about earlier but you know on that thing that i didn't have much clarity on you know mm. in terms of you know being a filmmaker and making a project every couple of years that might or might not do anything but now mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very clear you know i have talents and um you know abilities as a as an artist but like not just because I want to make art, just because, you know what I'm saying? I, and I've right. honestly, thankfully, I've never been that type of person. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always kind of, you know, drifted towards the things I wanted to do in order to, you know, because I felt compelled in some way to participate in the world around me, you know, to try to push, you know, my community forward or humanity forward in some way or another, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I've journeyed through that, you know, to increasingly increasing degrees of clarity on, like, what it is that I want. And yeah. I'm very clear now that, like, to me, the whole goal is liberation, period. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whatever I end up doing. And yeah. so now I can take that and um, subordinate my artwork to that goal. You know, I make art in order to, as, as just another means to bring about liberation, you know, for black people mm-hmm. and all of us people. And so mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I, 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 I write. I still work on my projects here and there. You know what I mean? I try to, you know, keep my practice as consistent as possible. Mm-hmm. But um, but I'm clear just on the hierarchy. You know what I mean? I'm clear on why I'm doing it. And yeah. um, and also, you know, there's two two kinds of ways that like my art finds expression. There's my own personal projects, mm-hmm. uh, which are enriched a thousand fold by the work that I do in the streets. And then mm-hmm. there's, you know, my art that I do as part of the organization because I'm a part of the media committee within the, uh-huh. uh, the alliance as well. You know, mm-hmm. so we, we, we are artists, we organize, you know, we're, we, we, we are, but, but our, we're not just an organization of artists just kind of floating around in space. You know, we are attached to a movement that is grounded, you know what I mean? The physical, real life, material struggle for greater democratic, you know, um, strength amongst black people, you know? And so we're clear on like the things that we need to accomplish and the purposes that our art serves, you know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. um, so uh, just kind of living in those, you know, working in those two kinds of spaces, you know, um, mm-hmm. feels like I've finally been able to, you know, address this issue of, conf- you know, this, conf- this conflict that existed, you know, previously, this contradiction between being an yeah. artist and being an organizer is actually to the resolution is to combine the two, you That's know it. what I mean? And to, mm-hmm. uh, like I said, subsume you know the art to the to the organizing and then you destroy that wall that divides the two Mm -hmm. you know and i know that like when i'm organizing i can't get to my script for a couple days it's all good because at the end of the day i am all up in you know that the that uh wellspring you know Mm -hmm. what i mean Mm -hmm. from which 
we artists draw, you know, um, our work. You yeah. know what I mean? The raw material of any artist is life. You know what I'm it's saying? Life. It's people in struggle. The mm -hmm. best raw material, actually, is people in struggle trying to, you know, push them and their, their own communities forward. And so I know that I'm always benefiting from from that experience, that I, um, from those experiences. And that when I do get to my art, it will be enriched by those things. And yeah. uh, so I, I don't stress about it anymore. I used to, but now I'm, I'm very clear on, like, you know, how the process works, you know? Yeah. And and um and 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 there's this thing, I just want to say. I know you're trying to ask another question, but I'll just say, there's this thing. That again, just going back to what we were saying earlier, how artists are encouraged to be very individualistic. Mm -hmm. You know, though we don't think of it in that terms, we're encouraged to just focus on the craft, stay in your house, shoot out the mm -hmm. project when it's done. You know, mm -hmm. say it with your art rather than getting involved in like you know collective action mm -hmm. and that's a defense mechanism mm -hmm. of the individual in a capitalist society whose feeling is that i have to protect my own unique vision you know mm -hmm. as an artist from the influence of the collective you know what i mean mm -hmm. i have to protect it and uh and nurture it in kind of you know isolation mm -hmm. Uh, so that is uniquely mine, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, what actually happens, you know what I mean, is this is actually what did me in and what really kind of got me through. What actually happens is by not attaching yourself to the activity of the masses who are mm -hmm. in the best position to fight back against the worst, you know, aspects of, you know, this kind of capitalist ideology that we all swim in mm -hmm. by not attaching yourself to those movements you only leave yourself open to capture by that ideology you know what Absolutely. i'm saying Absolutely. Yeah. you only leave yourself open to just you know um liberal ideology and uh you know continued degrees increasing degrees of individualist you know kinds of um art making and 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 um and uh you know, whatever kinds of aspirations you might end up, you know, taking on as a as an individual here in this society, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. you can call yourself somebody who makes films for the for the movement or for the people and shit, but it's all guesswork. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You're if just you're sitting in your home, just like yeah. I think this could be useful to the movement. I think this might be helpful to these types of folks, but mm -hmm. it's it's not ideas that you've tested in the street. You have right. no way of knowing. You know right. what I'm saying? The only real way to know what the street is up to, what the people are up to, you know, what the people, you know, could even want or need is to attach yourselves to them in struggle in the pursuit of those things. That's you know, right. And then you test out those ideas and then you start to get a sense of what can be helpful, you know, and then mm -hmm. you also start to see yourself as part of those people as rather than, a detect, you know, a, um, absolutely you know, kind of, um, you know, somebody on the outskirts, you know what I mean? You find that you're pursuing your own interests in that way as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny because for me, I think the way I came into hip hop was, well, one, like I'm a ch child of activists. So, you know, my dad's a, a Marxist organizer. Like right. my parents literally met each other through organizing. So I grew up that way, you know, um, and hip hop music has always just been a part of community organizing where I grew up in Seattle. Right. Like. I came into making music in 1999, the same year that the WTO protests went up and my crew was in the middle of it, you know, mm -hmm. doing music. And I got a complete political education because of hip hop. So mm -hmm. like, I feel what you're saying, but it's also almost like I forget sometimes that art is so individualistic for a lot of people because it's always been so collective for me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like I've been in a bubble <laughs> yeah. where, but, but also like I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to other artists and creators who like yourself are, you know, obviously like connected to, to movement and make art that really reflects what people are going through. You know, you can only do those things if you are in real community, if you're having those real critical conversations with people that go both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you can tell, and you can tell by, whatever it is, whether it's a song, whether it's a film, whether it's a book, when people aren't connected, you can just, you know, you 
can yeah. just see it, you know? Yeah. How many times it, have you watched something on Netflix? Like, black people don't talk like that. Right. <laughs> Even something so simple as that. Right. You most of I mean? the time. Honestly, yeah. most of the time, you know? Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, it goes even deeper than that to what mm-hmm. these black people aspire to do in these mm-hmm. stories, aspire to be. You know, yeah. who, who is heroicized by these stories, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's usually, you know, f- fucking military or this or that type of person, but it's never like the people that we know best and that we care most about, you know, who are really just janitors, fucking, you know, uh, yeah. drivers, teachers, you know, all these kinds of like regular folks, but yeah. who live heroic lives, but we never see them, you know, kind of um, in that light, you know, yeah, um, in that light. Yeah. And, and when they are the subject of the story, it's never, you know, um, mm-hmm. It is always just like to be, you know, to feel bad about them, to be feel, right. feel bad for them, you know, that circumstances are out of their control. You know what I mean? They're never really agents. You know, it's like Haile says, my dad, you know, um, they're always yeah. robbed of their history making capacity. You know what I mean? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Your dad, I, I've tried so hard not to talk about your dad this whole interview, but <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love that I'm having this conversation with you now. Yeah. Um, because I really, I really, I really credit your father as like one of my biggest teachers in storytelling. I never was his student, you know, but I did meet him when I was quite young. I was 19 years old. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, he was doing a run. He was uh, showing Sankofa over in Vancouver, BC, and I was there. Wow. And um, there was a bunch of a bunch of hip hop artists who went to go see this film. Mm-hmm. And afterwards, we were all so moved by it that we were freestyling outside in a circle, you know. And we're having a cipher basically outside your dad's film. And he came and joined us wow. and, he, and, and he was listening to us rap. And I swear, like outside of my mother, hmm. your dad was the first Ethiopian of his entire generation that hmm. I ever interacted with who saw something in what we were doing and said, this is important. And he was wow. telling us he had just done like a, like he was showing his film in Europe hmm. and he was, and, and he was talking about how, he saw the hip hop movement out there. And he was like, this thing that you're doing, it's global. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's important. Yeah. Keep telling your story. Yeah. I remember I talked to him afterwards and just kind of connected with him on just, I want to talk to an older Ethiopian kind of thing. And he told me to come study with him. And I wow. never did. <laughs> I, I never saw him again, probably until 2008, until I was rapping, you know, at Sankofa. Yeah, Sankofa, yeah. Yeah, so, but I've just learned so much from listening to him speak through the years, like everything from, tell the story that you hunger to hear that's something i think about all the time because if you hunger to hear that story it's probably because there's a void nobody else is telling that story you know something i think about constantly and also um something that i feel like you push back against very hard in your film was um Haile was the first person to tell me about <clears throat> in hollywood how there's this thing called the point of entry like where does the white person enter into the story you know, and I loved in your film how most of the white characters are off screen, you yeah. know, yeah. almost all of them, you know, yeah. Yeah. and I feel like that was a really, really intentional choice you made there. Do you, uh, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. You know, we call them window characters. Yeah. You know, it's um the character, the white character through which, you know, a liberal white audience can enter into the story and, and uh, mm-hmm. relate, you know, to mm-hmm. be able to say I would be that nice slave owner, you know what I'm saying? I would right. be that person who's fighting against, you know, uh, fighting for black people and shit like that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, you see it and it makes you so angry, you know, yeah. that they insist on being in every film. There's no film, even to this day, you know, that comes mm-hmm. out of the industry that doesn't have, you know, some white character. Right. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, uh, you know, they're in the story of DC because they're the ones coming to gentrify. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, yeah, there was one moment where I was just like, "This is my film." <laughs> you yeah. know, what I'm saying? like, where will I ever get this chance? You right. know, to um, to uh, impose my will on the situation in this way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're just going to center the frame right here on these black yeah. faces and how this impacts us because that's yeah. what's important right now. That's it. That's yeah. it. And um, it felt so good. It felt like a Mm-hmm. A little revolution when we we were forced into the into the situation because mm. uh, we didn't have enough white people for all the parts. <laughs> we couldn't. We had a, we had a hard time casting white folks. 
Mm-hmm. Which is crazy, you know, in, in the city that, you know, without people even knowing what kind of film it was, it was, it was mm-hmm. hard to you know, get people to come to the part of town we were shooting at. Okay. So we had to, you know, the few white people we were able to get, um, we, we used them in multiple roles. Uh, so the first time that happened, we were like, oh, this is kind of a thing. In order to, you know, be able to shoot this white person again, we can't show his face, so let's just shoot his arm. Yeah. And then after that, we were locked in. We was like, well, let's lean into this, you know, let's, let's take it mm-hmm. away. And um, <clears throat> it felt like, yeah, they take up so much space in the city, you know, but in my film, you know, we can we can relegate them to the sidelines. And but then it, it also that kind of early decision made the film. It was a it, it ended up being a better creative decision for the film anyway, because the film it now is hyper focused on the people that, you know, that, mm-hmm. that Jay, the main character, is, um, is his people who he wants to know what's up with them, you know? Yeah. And um the film doesn't focus on white people because Jay's not focused on white people, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was it was it autobiographical the story? For sure. Let me just say there was a white woman in France. I think there was probably a good amount of white people who had a problem with it, but one one white woman in France who who really had a problem with it, and she felt that it was an attack on white people. And, oh wow. Uh, yeah, she was like, you know, you just all these white people in your film that you just make them look so evil and this and that. And um, I was like, well, it feels like that to you because this is the first time you've, you've ever seen that. But, you know, every time black people have been, you know, um, treated in worse fashion, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Dehumanized, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to a great degree and relegated to just the sidelines of every story you've ever seen. You know, did you That's notice? Right. You know, mm-hmm. of course she, she didn't. And uh, I mean, she she went on to say, we don't have racism in France. She was that type of white woman. It's like, France is not racist. Yeah. It's a U.S. thing. So, which kind of shows you kind of where she's at, you know what I mean? But it was just like an interesting moment, you know, where like, you that's know a policy of That's a policy of France, by the way. Like, Oh, for real? We, we spent, we've we spent some time in Paris these last couple of years, and we learned that in France, they they don't do any census tracking, and they they're so hyper focused on the idea of French identity yeah. that they they really teach their whole society to act like race really doesn't exist. And if you even like to acknowledge race yeah. is they do see it as an as an attack on French identity. Like it's it's, it's so wild because you're also talking about I mean Paris I think is the blackest city in in Europe actually. Yeah. And um and I mean you can just see you can just see the discrimination and oh, yeah. just walking down the street, like it's clear oh, yeah. as day. Who's yeah. working where, where they live, like it's just clear. Yeah. But as a as the country's policy, they don't talk about race. Yeah. You know? So that doesn't yeah. surprise me that that happened to you in France at all. <laughs> nah, I mean, yeah. Every other, you know, white French kind of fr- friend or person that I've known has kind of upheld, you know, that position. It's, it's not surprising mm-hmm. that it's, you know, it's a matter of policy. Yeah, um, it's only the black and Arab folks that you meet, you know, from France who just like no illusions, you know. What I'm saying? Like, what the fuck are they talking yeah. About? yeah, yeah, and especially the the Arab folks out there, like the Algerian people, like they're they're the ones who are really in the crosshairs in that country, you know. Yeah, yeah. like it's all of us, but especially them, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, man. This has been a joy and a pleasure. Uh, I don't want to take your whole day up, you know, but uh. Yeah. That storytelling, man. I just, I, I did have a thought when you were talking earlier about um, just the connection between filmmaking and organizing, right? Mm. When I look at all of the work that I do, it's um, they're all different forms of storytelling, and I do think that storytelling is an important weapon, and especially with what we're seeing happening in Palestine right now, they're mm. using storytelling as a weapon too. They're using storytelling as a weapon to dehumanize, mm. and through that process. That's how they justify to their own people, like mm-hmm. how this gen, like it's how they justify a genocide, basically. So I do, I do think that the work that we all do as storytellers is vitally important, especially when it's connected and it's absolutely a part of movement work, and it's done better when we're actually a part of those movements that we want to represent. So absolutely. I just want go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Now I just want to commend you for for the work you're doing and 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 say to you know 
keep it up, man. You're inspiring people. It's it's really important. And uh, one more thing I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on, but, um, you know, as, as someone who's black, but also as someone who's Ethiopian, like speaking up for Palestine, mm. it's so important. Like one connection that I don't see a lot of people making or talking about is a situation with uh, Ethiopian people in Israel mm-hmm. who... Um, uh, uh. force force conscripted all of them mm-hmm. but also horribly discriminated against the forced sterilizations that women have had to go through when they enter that country the amount mm-hmm. of ethiopian people in prison mm-hmm. um but also they're situated against the palestinian people and, and a lot of them still wave the flag super hard for zionism and even talking about like <laughs> the need for solidarity <laughs> between Ethiopian Jews and Palestinians like that, that is a conversation that does not happen and, and is damn near made illegal in, in yeah. that country, you know? So yeah. yeah, to see, to see someone who's of Ethiopian descent going super hard in America, like it means a lot, you know? And if, if, if no one said that to you, like, I want to say that to you, that it, it, uh, it really means a lot, you know? Yeah. I appreciate you, you know, and um, every, every Ethiopian I know is, is, is on the same page, you know, they already right. know what's up. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm glad you brought this up, Dan. It's two two things that came up. Mm. Uh, one, you know, these kinds of um, Ethiopian Ethiopians in um, lost in La Mancha, you know what I'm saying, that's out there in mm-hmm. Israel. That shit is one. It's super embarrassing, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying, when they're defending kind of genocide of uh, yeah. Palestinians and then kind of using, leveraging their blackness to kind of fight back against, you know, black folks who are um you know taking up the position you know who are pro-palestinian mm-hmm. and um but you know in the same way that it's just like you you can understand it as the same kind of way that black folks are you know through you know are economically forced to take up you know to to join the military you know to go mm-hmm. kill other other poor people you know what i'm saying around the world it's mm-hmm. equally embarrassing and also you you understand that it's just kind of like a function of like you know, the society which, you know, um, creates the conditions for people to be, you know, kind of languishing in poverty and give them one way out, which is through the military. And it's the same situation. I'm, a, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'll, I'll only take it this far because I'm, I haven't investigated, but, mm-hmm. you know, it has all the hallmarks of that in Israel, you know, with the way that um, kind of you see black people peppered in. You know, mm-hmm. But then you also see black people peppered in Palestine, you know what I mean? As yeah, part absolutely. of the resistance. It's, it's absolutely. always just like a fist up moment, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because it's such a beautiful thing to see. And you know that these Afro-Palestinians have been a part of the resistance from the beginning, you mm-hmm. know? And um, so, uh, you know, yeah, there's there's that kind of whole thing. And, and they, they it feels redeeming, you know, to kind of see them, you know, kind of taking up like, uh, taking up the revolution like that. But But I wanted to say one thing about Ethiopia, in my dad's film and um don't let me forget so adwa uh-huh. but there was something i wanted to respond to oh about the narrative you know and mm-hmm. the power of the narrative is like what we're seeing for the first time is you know this the narrative being wrenched out of the hands of the of the ruling class you know what i'm saying by palestinians mm-hmm. you know what I mean? using social media to now tell their own story to such great effect that they yes. have defeated Israel at their own game of propaganda, you know what I'm saying? That they have fine-tuned over the decades, Yeah, you know? And also just to point to the fact that, and also, you know, overthrowing really the mainstream media, this is probably the, you know, the end for them, you know, in many ways for yeah. you know, our generation and younger. Um, but uh, the social media itself, which is like this tool, another kind of tool to just, you know, of capitalist exploitation of, you know, of mm-hmm. all of us, which they have used, um, but they cannot turn off the spigot because they cannot lose. You know, they can't, they can't, you know, they need it. Mm-hmm. They need to continue to make that money. And so you see them right. censoring people on social media just enough that like people mm-hmm. are kind of pissed off, but like yeah. are not going to like stop using the app. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you see how when they create these these avenues of exploitation, they're always two two lane streets. You know what I'm saying? They're always right. lanes that we can use, you know, against them as well. And so, right. you know, you kind of see just kind of how uh, the solution comes with the problem. You know what I mean? That they create. You know. And, mm-hmm. um, so it's a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's a it's a beautiful process. I'll just finish by saying I'm helping my dad with this film, 
about yes. the second Italian invasion of Ethiopia. It's mm-hmm. called Black Lions, Roman Wolves. Mm. And he's been working on it since the 90s, you know, over 20 mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, one section of it I'll just t- talk about deals with uh, when the Italians were getting ready to invade, the way that they used the League of Nations, mm. which was the predecessor to the UN, mm-hmm. you know, which came out of World War I. All these mm-hmm. countries came together, European countries came together to say, you know, let's uh, never let this happen again. You know, this is going to be our kind of way for, you know, kind of collective peace is through the, you know, League of Nations and shit. And Ethiopia was the only African nation, you know, involved, you mm-hmm. know, that was a member. Mm-hmm. And Haile Selassie mm-hmm. felt that his membership would protect him from Italian invasion, you know, the Italians who were foaming at the mouth to, you know, mm. you know, to come back because they, they were defeated in 1896. Mm-hmm. And they, for 40 years, Mussolini, really part of the way he came back was on his platform that I'm going to go back to take, you know, Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the way that the British, the French, and the Italians conspired mm. Mm. You know what I mean? Conspired around behind the back of the Ethiopians to ensure, mm-hmm. you know, that I- Italy would be able to invade, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? To, to enable and facilitate their invasion of Ethiopia, you mm-hmm. know, to protect their own colonial interests in Africa, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, rather it go to an Italian than to stay with Africans and inspire a revolution around them, you know, whatever. And um, at every turn would just, you know, betraying Ethiopia. And showing, mm-hmm. you know, its true function as just another imperial tool, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and the corollary to today, the way mm-hmm. that Palestinians, the Palestinian resistance is showing that the UN is really just another fucking imperial tool for the United States. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? By one vote, they can, you know, veto uh, the whole can, thing. Veto yeah. the whole thing and allow genocide to continue, mm-hmm. you know, showing the whole thing as the farce that it is. Right. You know what I mean? And uh, and right. there's so much kind of overlap between that moment and now. Mm-hmm. It's really crazy to see, you know, from that to the invasion itself. They genocided Ethiopians. Yeah. You know what I mean? they But but by enabling Italy to go do that, Britain, you know, uh, the UK and, and uh, France and all these other countries um, brought World War II on themselves, mm. you know, because this was early shots in 1935. This, along mm-hmm. with Manchuria, were the early shots, you know, fired and in, in, uh, leading right into, the, into World War II, you mm-hmm. know, and had those kinds of uh, warnings been heated in terms of the direction that Italy and, uh, and Germany were headed, you know, um, at least some of this could have been, you know, kind of uh, well, po- possibly forestalled. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But um, at the end of the day, it's, I can't wait for this film to come out because it really, it really also will help to uh, illuminate further, you know, what what we're seeing going on in the world today, and uh, the way yeah. that these, you know, these um, white supremacists, you know, these, these imperial powers just kind of, you, you know, use the rest of the world as their play as their playground, you know. Yeah, yeah. man, I can't wait to see it. It's wild that you that that that's what you're working on right now, and that you brought it up. Um, I'm currently reading Mazamin Gist's The Shadow King. I don't know if you've read this book or you're familiar with it, but yeah. it's I, I believe it's the first historical fiction book about this exact time period in Ethiopia. Wow. And she's my next guest on this podcast. Oh, let's go. Come on. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because the last person I interviewed was Saul Williams, who on his own brought up wow. your name. Wow, wow, wow. So, so it's like a it's like yeah. it's like a through line, you know. So yeah, that yeah. that's that's, that's dope that you brought that up. Yeah, hell yeah. Talk yeah. about somebody who's going hard, you know what I'm saying, this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Both of y'all. I mean, and there's so many people, you know, people yeah. are really just showing themselves, you know, like, sure. Sure. yeah. Sure. And the ones and ones who are showing up, man, it's just, yeah. my love, my love for you is just so just through the roof right now, you Seriously. know? Seriously. Yeah. 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 Well, man, thank you so much. It's been a joy and a pleasure. Is there, is there any other last thoughts you want to, you want, you want to leave the people with? Um, yeah, man, just, just kind of just the fact that at the end of the day, the answer is solidarity. You know, that's another thing that is, that this moment is, is showing true clarity on, you know, it's just the fact mm-hmm. that the antidote to all of these things and the answer to your original question around why this matters, you know, for black folks, because mm-hmm. solidarity is the way through, you know, division right. is the way that this happens and solidarity is the way through. 
Um, and, um, and this, this moment is the, the, the best opportunity. You know what I mean? You're seeing it left and right. You know, so many, so many people are drawing connections all over the planet and showing how, like, you know, the thing to do right now is stand in solidarity with Palestinians, you know, mm-hmm. to even to, to further my own interests, you know, yeah. is to stand in, in solidarity with, with Palestinians and to help them achieve theirs, you know. And uh, it's, it's beautiful, man, from here to there to, I mean, even this kafia, it was a, it was a, it was a sister in, in, in Jordan. Mm. We found out I didn't have a kafia. She sent me this joint. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's dope. It was a sign of like love. You know what I mean? Appreciation that's for like dope. the work I was doing. And so like, that's dope. You know what I mean? To me, that's just like it's a standout kind of thing of like a connection we ne- I never would have had. You know, I right. never would have had the opportunity to make. You know what right. I mean? And yeah. uh, and now it's just like to me, you know, one of the highlights of of this fucking decade. You know what I'm saying? And so mm-hmm. yes, yeah, so, um, we're only getting stronger. You know what I mean? If you just think of it as one movement from mm-hmm. 2020 to now, how much stronger we are because of that experience, and then mm-hmm. for the next one, how how much stronger we're gonna be. I'm going to be right. running a kafia and then maybe some other shit, you know, from right. who knows, I'm be on top of the, on top of the do-rag, the kafia and something else. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, it's going right. to be something from, like, the Caribbean or something, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. whatever kind of symbol of struggle and solidarity, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just it's a, it's an incredible moment. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. So the lesson, the lesson for everyone out there, if you're feeling helpless, if you're feeling like, burnt out go get involved it'll charge you up it'll give you that good yeah. energy you know Seriously. Seriously. yeah morale we appreciate you so much man we're gonna we're gonna keep building um yeah stay stay on the line and uh yeah yeah appreciate you bro i want to thank my guest marawi garima for being so generous with his time and stories that interview we mentioned with maza mingis did get pushed back to later in january It's still coming, though. Stay tuned next week for the next episode of the Worldwide Underground. GabrielTeodros.substack.com is where you go to sign up and support this work. If you love this podcast, subscribe. Give it a good rating. You know, all the good things that people do to support podcasts. We appreciate it. Appreciate y'all so much. Be back with you next week. Till then, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and get involved. Oh, real importantly, did this whole episode with the organizer from Chicago and almost failed to mention that I'm about to be in Chicago with my spouse, Ijoma Oluo, at an event on New Year's Day all-day event called the people for gaza you can find me on social media at gabriel teodros on instagram or gabrielteodros.com for more information also going to have ijoma on the podcast pretty soon to talk about her new book coming out the end of january be a revolution like i said there's a through line through all of the work that we're doing here all right see you next week for real Appreciate y'all so much. Till then, peace and free Palestine.